G'day guys and welcome to this Blessings of Corn Masterclass. If you want to learn how to get the most out of this absolutely fantastic ability, this video is for you. We're going to break down the specifics of how the Blessings of Corn works and in detail each one of the abilities that you can select and how they combo together. We're going to talk about some of the stratagems and the synergies that they have with the Blessings of Corn. We're going to talk about World Eaters data sheets and which ones get the most out of these amazing army abilities. And then finally, we're going to showcase some really nifty tools that you can use to track your Blessings of Corn and some really cool things that you can do when making these dice rolls. So if you're looking to master the Blessings of Corn and get the most mileage out of this insanely powerful army rule, then this video is for you. Let's get stuck into it. G'day guys, I just wanted to take a sec to thank the team from the Army Painter for sponsoring this channel. Regardless of if you're a professional hobbyist or a lazy drongo like me who can't be arsed painting his army, the Army Painter range is chockers full of products that are perfect for you. Their speed paint range is a beauty and is a no walkers way of getting your army battle ready when you have bugger all time before your next event. Their Fanatics range is ripper for when you want to put the hard yakker into your models so they stick out like dog's balls at events. And their hobby tools are fair dinkum as good as a snag at a summer barbie. I for one was bloody stoked with their wet palette system. So if you want to step up your hobby, give them a look either at thearmypainter.com or check them out at your local hobby shop. Now let's crack on with the video. Alright, let's start by talking about the timing, the specifics about when this Blessings of Corn roll is going to take place. And as you can see, it happens at the start of the battle round, which means the first roll that you're going to make is going to be the start of the first battle round, which is going to be after both players have deployed their armies, after both players have made any scout moves that they have. However, it's going to take place before the first player takes the command phase of their first turn. Now this means a few things that are really important. One of them is that it will take place before you know what your secondary objectives are. But also it will take place after you've done your scout moves. So there's a thing where you're going to have to basically scout move, make your decisions in that, that deployment and the scout move you know, part of the game without knowing what your blessings of corn rolls are going to be. And then you're going to find out what your blessings are. You're going to find out who's going first and second and then you're gonna draw your secondary card. So you're not gonna know what your blessings are going to be at that time, but you will know what they are when you draw your cards. So based on that, you can sort of make various decisions on which cards you'd like to select. So it's really important to note that you won't know what your secondaries are when making your blessings roll. So you have to pick a blessings roll that is going to work regardless of what secondaries you have. And you won't know what blessings you're gonna have when you make your scout moves. So you have to do your scout moves intelligently so that they are a wise move regardless of what blessings rolls you would get. We'll go through that in a little bit more detail when we break down the specifics of each blessing, but it's worth noting that that's the way that the timing works. Making a blessings of corn roll is super easy and it's even easier if you pick up one of these blessings of corn trackers from J15 games on Etsy. I'll show you how it works and we'll make a few example blessings rolls now. So basically the way the blessings roll works is you take eight dice like so, you roll them out and then what I do to make my life a little bit easier is I group them. So I grab my sixes, put them together. I grab my two fives there, put them together and then I've got a one, a two and a three. And now, depending on whether or not you have jackals on objectives or favorite of corn or whatever, you're going to be able to re-roll some of those. And I'll show you some examples of how that works in a moment. But basically, once you've got those, you now know what options you have. Now, this little blessings tracker is really nifty in that it shows you what you have. So you've got uh, down here, it's got a two times X, which means any double. You've got the raffled version, two times X, any double. You've got martial excellence. This has got two times three plus, which means any double that is a three or higher. You got a two times four plus or three times X. So two that are greater than a four plus or any triple. And then down the bottom here, you've got two by six or three of any four plus. So any triple that's greater than a four plus. So based off of this role that we've got here, we have got triple six, which means if Angron had died, we could have resurrected him, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but basically we could use those to activate advance and charge, right? And basically we're using two by six there. So you remove the two by six from your available pool. 
and now that's what you've got left to play with. And then basically from there, we've got two fives, so we might use that to put fights on death on, because it requires two four pluses, or we might use it to put warp blades on, because that requires two five pluses. And basically you put these little magnetic strips in there to track what blessings you have, and now you've got this nifty little thing as a reference that you can refer back to at any point during the battle round to see what blessings you have available. Now you'll notice that there's a third little magnetic marker that comes with this, and that's because there's a stratagem that we'll go into detail on that allows you to make an additional blessings roll, so you could, in theory, activate three at once. Alrighty, just a quick word on Angron. He does have an ability, which is called Reborn in Blood, that means basically each time you make a Blessings of Corn roll, if this model's been destroyed, you can use a triple six from that roll to activate the ability, in which case you basically take him, he's no longer destroyed, and you place him back into reserves. So using this example roll that we had before, you could take these three sixes and remove them from the pool, and now you can activate your Angron's ability Reborn in Blood, and you can bring him back into reserves. Now, it's worth noting that this does not prevent you from making further Blessings abilities. So you've still got your two fives there, you've still got your one, your two, and your three, and you can still use those to activate Blessings on here. However, looking at this, there's not a great deal that we can do with that, so I'm going to show you another neat little trick. All right, let's say we've got a couple of units of Corn Berserkers, and the same can be said for Jackals, and these guys are on objective markers. Well, they have a War Gear ability that is each time you make a Blessings roll, if the Bearer's unit is within range of an objective marker that you control, you can re-roll one of the dice. Now, it's worth noting that this is objective markers that you control. So in the very first battle round, you won't be able to use this ability because that's happening at the start of the battle round, which is happening before the first command phase, and objective control is determined at the start or end of any phase. So in that first battle round, when you're making your blessings roll, technically at that point of the game, you don't control any objective markers. So you can't use this ability then. However, in every other blessings roll that you make, if you control an objective marker with berserkers or jackals, you will be able to make a blessings reroll. And it's also worth noting that you'll be able to make multiple. If you've got three units of berserkers all on the same objective marker, you could reroll three of these dice. All right, so now if we go back to our blessings roll, this is the way I view the rerolls. So I basically look at it and I'm like, those two fives are actually quite useful to us. We can use those. However, we can't use a single one, we can't use a single two, and we can't use a single three, right? Because every ability requires, at very minimum, a double, and the higher the value of the double, the better. So generally, you want to re-roll your lowest single values. So in this instance, let's say hypothetically we had two units on objectives. We've got maybe a unit of berserkers on the midfield somewhere, and we've got a unit of jackals holding our backfield objective. So we can re-roll two of these blessings dice. I would re-roll the one and the two. And the reason that I do that is that there's some abilities like martial excellence, for example, that requires a triple three plus. So hypothetically, if we roll these and we get double three, we would be able to use that ability. Now, we haven't rolled our double three. We have got two ones, though, which is better than the one and the two that we had previously, because now those double ones, we can use those to activate an ability. So now that we've made our two re-rolls, we've made our blessings roll, we've brought Angron back, we can now, from the remaining dice, select our two abilities. So in this case, you would probably select maybe the plus two move and with the two ones and the feel no pain with your uh, five and six, uh, your double fives and now you're basically you're going to have an army that's a little bit tougher than everybody else would be expecting and a little bit faster than everyone else would be expecting which is fantastic but we'll go through the specifics on which abilities you're going to want to choose and when in a moment Alrighty guys, before we move on from the specifics about how to make a Blessings of Corn roll, I want to quickly talk about the Favoured of Corn Enhancement. Now this is a 20 point upgrade that you can put on a character. You can't put it on named characters, so Khan and Angron and Lord Invocatus cannot take this. But if you've got a Master of Executions or a Juggernaut Lord in your army, they can take this, or a Demon Prince for that matter, they can take this Enhancement, and that's going to allow you to make an additional Blessings roll. So the way it works is World Leaders model only, once per battle, when you make a Blessings of Corn roll, before doing anything else, the bearer of this, you can use this enhancement. If it does, discard all of the dice from that roll and make a new Blessings roll. 
This new roll does not count as a re-roll, and therefore any rules that enable you to re-roll or manipulate individual dice, e.g. icons of corn, can still be used. So there's a few ways to interpret this, so be sure to check with your TO, but essentially what happens here is if you roll your dice and it's a really bad roll, you can just re-roll the whole lot and then make it re-rolls on individual dice after the fact. Now it's worth noting that this specifically says that you make a roll, then immediately, before doing anything else, you discard the roll. Now the reason that I say you want to check this with your local TO is because some TOs have ruled it that any re-rolls that you make on that first roll count as part of the roll. So you basically you make your roll, you make any re-rolls from jackals or whatever, then you go, you know what, I still don't like it, I'm going to discard that and make a new roll, and then make re-rolls based on that. So that's one interpretation. And the other interpretation is that you make one physical roll, and if you don't like that, you discard it. You don't get to make any re-rolls, and then discard. So check with your local TO on how they rule the favourite of corn, and if in doubt, play conservatively, don't try to be gamey, and just play it where you make a roll. If you don't like it, you can discard it, then make another roll, and from there, you can make your re-rolls. I hope that wasn't too confusing. I know the word roll and re-roll was used a lot there, um, but essentially the, the concept is is making using this enhancement to discard a roll and make a new roll. And the only question is, do re-rolls count as part of a roll, or are they separate to it? In which case, the timing of when you use this enhancement to discard a roll could become into question. So check that with your local TO. Um, but yeah, that's how this enhancement works. All right, now that we've gone through how to make a blessings roll, let's talk about what the abilities are that you're able to select with this roll and what they are going to provide for your army in terms of output. So first we've got Rage Fueled Invigoration. This is any double required to activate it and it's gonna give you army-wide plus two to your movement characteristic. This is absolutely fantastic on your really fast units like your 8-bound. It's going to push them up into crazy amounts of speed. Same can be said for Angron. And it's also really, really good on your slower models like your Terminators, for example, because they go from having a 5-inch move to a 7-inch move, which means the increase in their movement is actually phenomenal, especially when you combine that with some stratagems that we'll talk about later. You can take a slow unit and make it deceptively fast. So that's the first ability that you can select, army-wide plus two movement. The next is called Wrathful Devotion. Basically, it's any double again, and models in your army have a six up feel no pain. And if they already have feel no pain from another ability, you add one to the feel no pain rolls. So this, again, is gonna make big things like Angron or Land Raiders really, really tough because all of a sudden they're gonna get essentially 13% extra wounds, which is fantastic. It's also going to make things like Jackals and Exalted 8-Bound and Spawn really, really tough because they already have a Feel No Pain, so it's going to push that up to the next level. Now, there's a thing that's worth noting here on Feel No Pain rolls, and one of the reasons why this particular ability is one that you're almost always going to want to select, and that is that if you have a 3-wound model and they hit you with a 3-damage attack, you get to roll 3 dice, and if any one of them is a 6 you're going to prevent that one attack from killing you, and that's roughly a 50% chance of that happening. So taking this, if you're about to get hit by three damage and you have three wound models, then you're dramatically increasing the survivability of those models. Similar can be said if you're getting hit with two damage weapons and you have a two wound model, but not quite the same because, of course, you've only got two attempts to roll a six there. But it is still a pretty dramatic increase in the durability of your infantry units. All right, next is called Martial Excellence, and this is a double three plus. So it's not any double, you both of those dice have to be higher than a three, and that's gonna give you sustained hits one, army wide. This is arguably the highest damage output boost that you can get from the Blessings of Corn against a lot of smaller targets. Being able to get that sustained hits is really, really powerful, particularly when you've got Angron nearby giving you reroll hits, or if you've got Khan leading Berserkers for those reroll ones, all of a sudden, the number of hits that you're putting out there are absolutely insane, often matching the number of attacks that you have. So it's really, really powerful, aggressive buff to your army to be able to give it sustained hits on every model. All right, next up we have Total Carnage. This is a double four plus or any triple. 
and basically what it's going to allow you to do is fight on death on a roll of 4 plus. So every time one of your models is removed as a casualty in melee, you can roll a d6, and on a 4 plus, that model gets to fight before being removed as a casualty. This is absolutely insane on big things like Angron, where he has a 50-50 chance of fighting on death and probably just wiping out the thing that killed him. It's somewhat less relevant on your smaller things like Jackals or even Berserkers because they aren't going to be doing as much damage when they do fight on death, but it still can be an absolute game changer this. I often find this to be quite swingy and hard to rely on, so it's a bit of a desperate measure, a bit of a gambit. If you're going down and you're in a lot of trouble, being able to turn on the fights on death is really good. But it also serves as a great deterrent. If you're versing a very combat-heavy opponent, and you go, cool, I'm turning on fights on death at the start of the battle round, all of a sudden they're going to second guess whether or not they want to pull off those charges. They're going to have to second guess how they go about engaging in combat, because if they don't do it smart and you fight on death, you're going to end up winning by killing them in their own turn. So it can be an absolutely game-changing ability, this one, particularly in the World Leaders Mirror Match, but it's one that I hesitate to rely on, simply because 4-ups can be swingy. Next we have Warp Blades. This is a double 5+, plus or any triple, and that's going to give every model in your army lethal hits. Now this one is probably not quite as powerful in terms of aggressive you know, buffs, as the sustained hits depending on which opponent you're versing if you're versing like imperial knights or something like tyranids where they've got a lot of big monsters and you're running around with berserkers that are wounding a lot of those things on either fives or sixes being able to get those lethal hits can be insanely powerful it's also really good on things like jackals that are really low strength and already have sustained hits built in if you put a big unit of jackals out there you put lethal hits on them they have inbuilt sustained hits and then you put Angron nearby for reroll hits, they actually put out a ridiculous amount of hits and a ridiculous amount of wounds, even on tough targets. It's not necessarily a strategy I would build an army around, but it's good to know that you have that as an option. And ultimately, the Blessings of Corn are a toolkit. There's lots of different options in here, and understanding each one and how to use them and when to use them is the key to getting the most out of it. And this is definitely one of those things where you want to remember that you have access to it if you need it. And then last but certainly not least, we have Unbridled Bloodlust. So this is a double six or triple four plus. So it's the hardest of them all to turn on. You need to roll really well on your Blessings roll. And this is why you want to use those Jackals rerolls and Favorite of Corn rerolls to full effect. But basically, this is going to allow every model in your army to advance and charge in the same turn, which is insanely powerful. There's plenty of armies that have stratagems for this, but generally they only affect one model in your army, not you know, an entire army. So having this as an army-wide rule is insanely powerful, especially when you pair it with things like plus movement, advancing six, those sorts of things. Really, really powerful. Now, before I get on to the specific combos, I just want to touch on something with the army rule of the Blessings of Corn, and that is that every one of these abilities that we've just listed affects your entire army. So it's worth noting that Corn is very much a go all in or go home kind of army because when you get advanced and charge, you want to be going, cool, I'm going to use this to make four or five charges this turn. You know, When you go, cool, everything in my army has sustained hits. That means you want to have lots of combats happening simultaneously. If you just have one combat happening at a time, you are not going to get the most out of these abilities. These abilities are designed to affect everything in your army, so you want everything in your army engaging at once. So there's a few ways to look at it. You could have a defensive posture where you go, cool, I'm going to put fights on death and feel no pain on my army, and I'm going to play a turn where I don't go out and engage in my opponent, but I've maximally disincentivized them from attacking me because I've got a defensive buff, so it's going to be hard for them to kill me, and even if they do kill me, there's a decent chance I'm going to kill them back in their turn. Or you might go, I'm going to put plus two move on and advance and charge, and I'm going to send everything in my army out and charge everything simultaneously. Or you might go, I'm going to put sustained hits and lethal hits on, and I'm going to be going in and I'm going to be doing as much damage this turn as possible. So they're the three main combos, but you can definitely splice those up depending on what you need in each given game state. So that's the Blessings of Corn, that's the army rules, and that's sort of my take on it. Now let's get into some of the specific combos that you can use to get a lot of value out of these. 
All right, there are a few stratagems that synergize really, really well with the Blessings of Corn. The first one is for the Skull Throne. It's one CP, and it's going to give you plus one to wound when you're targeting an enemy, monster, character, or vehicle. So this is going to put your damage output higher. So generally, you're going to want to combine this with the Blessings of Corn roll that gives you sustained hits. You don't necessarily want to combine this with the lethal hits because if you're doing lethal hits that's removing the likelihood of you needing to make a wound roll because every six to hit automatically wounds so then buffing your wound roll you get a little bit less value out of it whereas if you take sustained hits every six to hit creates an additional hit which means an additional wound roll so when you put sustained hits on and plus one to wound now all of a sudden you're increasing the amount of hits you get therefore increasing the amount of wound rolls that you make and then you're gaining an advantage on the wound rolls that you make, really pushing the damage output of your World Eaters units through the roof. This is particularly good on a big unit of Corn Berserkers with Khan attached, because now you're getting reroll ones to hit, reroll ones to wound, you're getting sustained hits, which means you're going to get a lot of hits, and then you're also rerolling those wounds with plus one to wound, and you're going to be putting out a ton of wounds. This unit is one of the best things in the World Eaters arsenal for killing things like your Necron Catan, your Magnuses, any of those things that are really, really high durability that have damage reduction, because damage reduction is very, very hard for World Eaters to get through, given that a lot of our things are two damage. So a unit of Corn Berserkers, 10 man with Khan attached, and these two, the enhancement for sustained hits, and the relic of a stratagem, sorry, for plus one to wound, is a very, very deadly combo. All right, next up we have For the Blood God. Now this one is in the fight phase just after a World Eaters unit from your army destroys an enemy unit, and basically you get to make an additional Blessings roll. So that's where that third little tab on the uh, Blessings tracker that I showed you guys comes into play. And there's a few different ways that you can use this. Importantly, depending on whether or not you go first or second. If you have the first turn, you're gonna be able to go out you're going to, at the start of your turn, basically, it's, which is basically the start of the battle round, you're going to make your blessings roll, you're going to pick your abilities, then you're going to be able to go out, hit your opponent, kill some stuff, and then use this stratagem to make an additional blessings roll before their turn. So this is really good in early game. You can use, for example, start of the battle round, use your blessings roll to put plus two move and advance and charge on. Then you go out, you move, you up, you charge, you kill something. Then you use this one stratagem to put Feel No Pain on as a Blessings roll. And now you get army-wide Feel No Pain for 1 CP. That's really, really powerful. But that doesn't necessarily work if you go second. Because if you go second and you take that same approach, so at the start of the battle round, you pick plus, one, uh, plus 2 move and advance and charge, then it goes straight into your opponent's turn, which means they're going to be able to hit you with no Feel No Pain active. So you've got to be real careful the way that you sequence your abilities and you always want to make sure that you're considering whether or not you got the first turn or the second. Because if you got the second turn and in your fight phase you kill an enemy unit, that's actually the last thing to happen before the start of a new battle round. So there's a lot less utility on this stratagem when you go second. Because if you go second, you kill something in your fight phase, you spend a CP to make a blessings roll, then we immediately tick over to the next battle round, and that Blessings roll is reset by the new one that you make at the start of the battle round. So bear in mind this stratagem is significantly more powerful when you're going first, particularly when you use this stratagem to resurrect Angron. There's nothing better than when it's your turn, you go in, say Angron's died, that's turn three in the game, you go in with your Berserkers and Khan, you kill something, you then spend a CP to make a Blessings roll, you roll triple six, you bring Angron back, then it immediately ticks over into your opponent's turn, and you can rapid ingress him straight away. So there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with this. The main ones, in my opinion, are being able to use purely aggressive Blessings of Corn rolls, like Lethal Hits, Sustained Hits, Plus Move, or Advance and Charge, using them at the start of the battle round, taking your turn, going in, hitting them, doing damage, then turning on your defensive ones, like Fight Sot and Death or the Feel No Pain. So that's one really cool way to use this stratagem. Another way to use it is to increase your damage output. So you might be really far away from your opponent, so you go, cool, I'm going to put plus two movement on, and I'm going to put advance and charge on, just so that I can get in. 
I'm going to use that to make lots and lots of combats. And then let's hypothetically say your opponent doesn't have two command points, so they're not able to interrupt the fight sequence. So you can fight with every unit in whichever order you want. What you do is you pick one unit that's going to be a relatively small combat that you're confident you're going to win. So it might be, you know, five berserkers into, you know, three or four scouts because you've killed a couple with your bolt pistols or whatever, and now you're going in, right? You fight with them first. Now you've killed those scouts. Now you use this stratagem. You use that to put sustained hits on. So now you have your plus move, your advance and charge, and sustained hits. And that sustained hits kicks in immediately, which means the rest of those combats that you've lined up, they all now also get sustained hits. Which means if you've got Angron into something really, really tough, you've got some Terminators in combat with something really, really tough, you've just pushed the damage output of those units really, really high. So that's something that you can do even if you're going second. It's a really powerful ability. And just think of it like one command point to give you army-wide one of the abilities on that list, which is really, really powerful. All right, next up we have Corn Cares Not. Now this is 2 CP, but this is one of my favorite stratagems that we have available to us. And basically it's in the fight phase after one of your units has been selected as the target of enemy attacks. You can basically put negative one damage on the attacks characteristic of your opponent. This is really, really powerful, especially when you put it on like a big unit of 10 Terminators or something like that, and they're coming at you with one, two, or three damage weaponry, or even four damage weaponry. So if they come at you with two damage and you turn it down to one, you've sort of halved their damage output. And I say sort of because when you factor in the feel no pain rolls, it's not quite that. And two damage attacks, it would take two attacks to kill a Terminator or eight bound, whereas reducing it to one damage means it's now going to take three attacks. So three attacks isn't quite double the two. So it's not quite halved incoming damage, but it's close. But if you're getting hit by a three damage attack, let's say hypothetically you're getting hit by three damage and you don't have feel no pain active, or you, you know, you're a regular eight bound, not an exalted or something like that. If they hit you with a three damage attack, every attack that comes through is going to kill you. Whereas if you put neg one damage on now, only half of them are going to kill you because basically it's going to take two attacks to kill you. And the reason that this pairs really, really well with the Blessings roll of Feel No Pain is because the two combined can make something like a Terminator or an 8-bound unit way tougher than people would generally consider. They'll look at it and they'll be like, oh, I've got a bunch of Riptides with three damage shooting. That's fine. That's perfect for killing these guys. But it's like, well, hang on. No, it's not because I've got the Feel No Pain. Or they might be going into you with combat where they're hitting you with four damage combat weapons. And you just go, cool, I'm actually going to make that a three damage combat weapon using this stratagem. And then I have a 50-50 chance of my blessings roll keeping me alive, which now means half of the four damage hits that come into you, you're going to actually bounce back at them. So that's really, really powerful combo, basically leveraging the damage characteristic of your opponent with that feel no pain that you get from your blessings roll is going to make your units really, really durable. And then last but not least, we have the Apoplectic Frenzy. This is one CP and basically it means that you can, instead of making a roll when you make an advance, you can just have six added to your move characteristic. Now this is really good in a few ways and it pairs really, really well, of course, with advance and charge. And what that does is that basically allows you, if you're taking a plus two move, you can take your eight bound, you deploy them on the line, you can scout move them forward six, then you can move them nine inches, so you've moved 15 inches, but then you can move an additional two inches from your blessings of corn, so now you've moved 17 inches. Then, using this strat, you can move an additional six inches with that advance, with no need to roll. So now, without needing to roll anything, you've moved 23 inches with your eight bound across the board. That's so fast. That's turn one, you're in your opponent's deployment zone practically, and you're charging things and you're doing massive amounts of damage. So this stratagem is really, really good. It's also really, really good for simple things like you need to get your jackals onto an objective and they've got, it's 14 inches away and you're like, well, the jackals have a six inch move and I can put plus two move on them and then advance. Now I can get jackals on that objective, which might deny your opponent that primary or it might get you your secure no man's land or something like that. And sometimes spending one CP to just guarantee those five victory points 
is absolutely worth it. So it's not always necessarily going to be used to do damage, but being able to combo it with the Blessings rolls to get plus two move to make something like Jackals crazy fast is also really important. So what you want to do with this is you basically want to, at the start of the battle round, before you know what your secondaries are, you need to consider where your units are placed and what distances they're going to likely need to travel. So if you've got some Jackals and you know that they're 18 or 14 inches away from an objective marker, you might go, you know what, I'm going to select plus two move so that in my turn, when I make my when I go in for that objective, I can spend a CP to auto six advance them and get on there. And that way, if I draw that objective card, whether it be secure no man's land or something like that, you know you'll do have to just be able to advance out or extend battle lines or something like that. So combining the auto six advance from this stratagem with the plus two move from the blessings of corn makes your units crazy fast. Particularly, and I love doing this with my world leaders, Terminators, because most people look at Terminators and they're like, they are only got a 5-inch move characteristic, I'll just stay away from them. But when you realise, well hang on, I can put plus 2 move on them, and I can put an auto 6 advance on them, which means they have a 5-inch move characteristic, but they can essentially add an additional 8 inches worth of movement to that, and go 13 inches, then charge things, you realise... They're actually crazy fast. They're more like a jump pack unit because 13 inches worth of movement than a charge is actually faster than your average jump pack unit. So you can use the blessings of corn and this ability to be crazy fast. And it, there's one thing that's really worth noting here is that neither of those things are things that you have to do, right? So you can tell your opponent at the start of the battle round when they're positioning their mo when they're you know in their movement phase when they're positioning their models. They can, you, they'll ask you, like, how far can you go? And you'll tell them, my Terminators can go 5 plus 2 plus 6 and then charge, right? So they'll stay away. And then when they stay away, well, then you go, cool, now that I know I can't charge you because you stayed away, I'm not going to take the plus 2 move and I'm not going to spend the CP on an auto 6 advance on those Terminators. And now your opponent's just hidden from something that they didn't really have to. And then in response, you can turn on something like the 6-up Feel No Pain and the Fight on Death and just move up into a piece of ruin somewhere. And now your opponent's put in a position where they have to spend their next turn coming out to get you. Because they were worried about you getting them, they actually missed an opportunity to engage in the game. So that's the stratagems and how they pair with the Blessings of Corn Rolls. Alrighty guys, I guess the last thing to cover off is just a general overview of the order of operations and which blessings I like to use and when. Now this is obviously very dependent on your opponent and very dependent on the mission and very dependent on the matchup and the game state and all those sorts of things. So consider this all general advice, but generally speaking, what you're gonna wanna do is in the early game, you're gonna wanna put plus two move and advance and charge on if you can. Now this is regardless of whether or not you're going first or second, and generally speaking, with World Eaters, you're going to want to deploy everything as hidden as possible, right? So your opponent can't really hit you in that first turn. And if you put plus two move and advance and charge, your opponent is going to go, okay, cool. I have to stay as far away from these World Eaters as possible. Because if I come in even a little bit closer, they're going to be able to get pretty reliable turn one charges, right? So your opponent's going to hide and they're going to stay outside of your range. And that's because you've selected plus two move and advance and charge. If you had selected something like sustained hits and fight on death, your opponent's going to be able to go, okay, cool, those terminators, they can move five inches and then charge, right? So that's a maximum of 17 inches with the 12 inch charge and a five inch move. So they're going to go 17.1 inches away from you. And now they know those terminators can't touch them, right? So having that additional threat range forces your opponent to deploy and move in such a way that they stay further away. Because if you say, okay, I've got plus two move and I've got advance and charge. So then your opponent goes, okay, cool. Those terminators can move five plus another eight. So 13, then charge 2d6. So that's now 25 inches they need to stay away, right? Now they're not going to hop out onto that objective because they know that if they do that, you're going to charge them with terminators. They're not going to jump into the center of the um, battlefield to do area denial or they're not going to jump out into the center of the battlefield to do uh, deploy teleport homers or whatever it's called now establish locusts you know all those sorts of secondaries they're going to look at it and they're going to be like yeah, I want to do it 
but if I do it, I'm exposing myself to his charges. So it makes it a little bit harder for your opponent. And then basically, depending on what they do, you either go in and attack, or you just stand and spend another turn sort of staging, moving a little bit closer, but not so close that you expose yourself. So that's the first turn. Plus two move, advance and charge if you can. Then, in your second turn, depending on what your opponent did, you're then going to want to turn on the aggressive stuff. This is when the fight's going to happen. You know, you spent your first turn moving up. They spent their first turn hiding from you, not making sure that they weren't exposing too much, getting in your charge range, etc. So that's the first turn done. Now, you've moved up. They can't hide from you again, which means they're going to probably come in, right? So that's the turn when you turn on Feel No Pain and Sustained Hits. Typically those two. Sometimes you want the plus two move depending on what's in your army and what positioning you have and whether or not you need to continue to threaten that distance. But generally speaking, sustained hits and feel no pain are really good here because it basically means that you're reducing the amount of damage that you're going to take in the inevitable fight that's about to take place and you're increasing the damage that they are going to take. And basically you're then going to keep those two active for the remainder of the game. You basically want to keep that feel no pain active any time when you think that there's units in your army that are going to be exposed to damage, you want the Feel No Pain active. And any time you're in a position where you're going to be able to make reliable charges without requiring advancing and re without requiring the additional plus two inches of movement, you then want to keep sustained hits on. And the only time that you change from that is if you know in order to pull off an important charge, you're going to need the advance and charge or you're going to need the plus two move. And that's when you basically would go, okay, cool, I'm going to keep the 6-up Feel No Pain active, but instead of sustained hits, I'm going to take the plus 2 move. Or instead of sustained hits, I'm going to take advance and charge. And this is really important because sometimes your opponent will realize what you're doing, and they will basically keep their stuff outside of your charge ranges to make it so that you have to continually take these movement buffs so that you don't get the damage buffs that you need and the durability buffs that you need. So that's one way that your opponent's going to try to play around the Blessings of Corn. They're going to basically sit as far away from you as possible. They're going to throw small disposable units in. And when they're throwing small disposable units, you don't need a damage buff because you're going to kill them anyway with like things like Berserkers or Spawn. And you don't really need a durability buff because if you're only presenting your Berserkers, they're going to fire their whole army at it and kill it regardless of whether or not you have the Feel No Pain. So in those situations, you want to keep the plus two movement active and you want to keep the advance and charge active so that you can continue to threaten those long bomb charges. And that's generally the way that this is going to work. Of course, any opportunity that you get to resurrect Angron, if you've taken Angron in your army, is obviously the first thing that you want to do. And then from there, you want to select the abilities based on what you need. Generally speaking, you're going to want the Feel No Pain active all the time. I can't count the amount of times where I've not had the Feel No Pain active because I've gone for that aggressive damage output and then my opponent has just picked up like seven or eight Terminators in one volley, and I'm like, damn it, I should have had the Feel No Pain. Whereas there's very rarely am I going in and hitting something and going, damn it, I should have had sustained hits. Because often through combos of stratagems and having multiple units charging, you're able to kill most things anyway, and the sustained hits is more if you want to try to stretch that damage to really roll your opponent over in one particular turn. And it's worth noting that the movement buffs, you really only need them early in the game, because generally by the later stages of the game, your opponent has either come in to meet you in the middle, because they need to hold those central objectives as well. They can't just sit in their home all game, they need to control the center as well. So if you're able to go out there and use the plus two move and the advance and charge early in the game, you're going to be able to get out there, you're going to be able to do your damage, and then you're close enough to your opponent that in subsequent turns, you don't really need them anymore. So it's worth noting that if you play it aggressively enough and if you're able to stage in terrain well enough that you're close enough to your opponent, then in the later game, you can switch over to sustained hits and feel no pain. Now, a quick word on fight on death. Uh, there's a few things about this. First of all, it's really, really good on big things like Mauler Fiends and Angron. It's not as good on things like Corn Berserkers. And the reason that is, is imagine if you've got a unit of Corn Berserkers all stretched out and they charge you know, three Exalted Eight bound into it, they can charge all three of them onto this side of the unit, wipe the whole unit out, then you have to roll to fight on death with each model in the unit. So you have to roll to see if he fights on death, then if he fights on death, then if he fights on death, then if he fights on death, so on and so forth. 
And if this guy fights on death, that actually doesn't help you because the eight bounder over here, he's pile in and whatever, is not going to be able to make attacks. So realistically, half of those guys probably aren't going to get to fight regardless. So it's really only a handful of guys that you're going to roll for. And if only half of that small handful roll a four plus and get to fight, you're not really going to do much damage to those eight bound that just charged you from the side. You know, And the same goes for any unit that's got a relatively high damage output with a relatively low model count. They're going to be able to hit you from an angle where most of your unit won't be able to fight on death. Whereas something like Angron, if they hit you, it doesn't matter where they hit you from, if he fights on death, he's going to fight the unit. So it's much more effective on single model units or low model units like 8 bound than it is on bigger units like Corn Berserkers or Jackals or any, anything like that. So that's one thing to note on the fights on death. And the other thing to note on the fights on death is that it's only on a 4 up. And you have to roll it on a model by model basis. So things like Berserkers where there's a special weapon in the unit, you know, you might not get to fight with your special weapons. You might only get to fight with the chain axe guys. You know, that's not particularly good. Or, you know, you might just fail. The amount of times that I've gone, cool, I'm going to take fights on death. My opponent charges, they kill all three eight bound, and I don't roll a single four plus. And now I'm just like, well, I took fights on death and it actually didn't help at all. And I should have had feel no pain or something like that. Because then maybe one of those eight bound would have lived. And then he gets to fight, right? So... Having something that increases your durability is kind of like having a fights on death in a way, you know? Like imagine a world where somebody kills Angron and you fail your fights on death roll and you're like, damn it, if I had taken the feel no pain instead, he, Angron might have lived. And if Angron lived, he would then get to fight and I would also still have an Angron in my army. So generally speaking, the durability buff of the six up feel no pain is better than fights on death in most cases based on all of those things. And it's also just way more reliable and consistent. Whereas fights on death, sometimes you'll fight at a, in, a, in a combat that doesn't really matter. And then in a combat that does really matter, you don't fight. And it's like, well, okay, cool. So I would strongly advise avoiding it. And only use it in real desperate situations where you're like, you know what, this is a world leader's on world leader's matchup. His Angron's going to hit my Angron. I want to be able to fight on death and kill his Angron. You know, like those sorts of things. That's where it becomes a little bit more interesting. But generally speaking, Feel No Pain is much, much better. You want to combine the Feel No Pain with sustained hits so that your damage output's really high. And then you also want to combine the plus movement with the Apoplectic Frenzy for an Auto 6 Advance and the Advance and Charge. The other thing to note is that if you do take World Leaders Terminators, which those of you who've been following the channel for a while now will know that I'm a huge advocate for World Leaders Terminators, the plus two move is actually really good on them. Because they have guns... Getting plus two move means you can move seven inches, you can shoot something, and then charge something else. And during the mid-game, that's really, really powerful. So even though during the mid-game, a lot of your eight bound and stuff are going to be fast enough to make those combats anyway, having plus two move on those Terminators, and maybe sustained hits, or plus two move and the feel no pain, two of the easiest rolls to get, are actually both amazingly powerful on Terminators. Because now you're jumping out, you're shooting down range, killing some scouts off of an objective, and then you're charging their unit of death company or something like that, and you're killing a bunch of them. Really, really effective. So, plus two move is definitely, it's the easiest roll to get, and it's arguably one of the best. Advance and charge is as good, but you know, if you advance, yeah, you might, you're rolling a d6. So if you roll a one or a two, it's the same as plus two move. If you roll a three plus, it's better. However, you don't get to shoot. So when you're running lots of Terminators, sometimes selecting the plus two move is better than selecting Advance and Charge because it's guaranteed two. So you're never going to roll a one on your Advance roll and be like, oh, wow, that was worse. I should have just took the plus two move. And also it unlocks all of your shooting. So really, really powerful blessings roll there. Uh, so I hope this was helpful, guys. I know... A lot of people have been asking me to make a video like this, particularly over in our Patreon Discord. They've been asking me to do some videos on the blessings of corn. So I hope you found that interesting, and I hope I wasn't rambling a little bit too much. The video wasn't structured quite as thoroughly as I normally do, so I hope it was easy enough to follow. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, all that good shit. Let me know in the comment section below how you feel about the blessings role and what your preferences are, and if you uh, found anything in this video interesting. And also, if you'd like to have input on future videos, 
head over to our Patreon. You can join there and we have a Discord community that's exclusive for Patreon subscribers. And in that Discord community, we do a lot of good work. We talk about list writing advice and strategy advice. And we also have a lot of conversations about what direction this channel can go in. And we share ideas on future videos. And this is one of the videos that's come from that Discord community. So if you want to see that sort of stuff, check that out. Links in the description. As always, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. The Warhammer community suffers from some of the most prohibitively expensive essentials in the world, especially Australian content creators. Every single day, Dean wants to create content, but he can't. Suffering from old, worn-out brushes, expensive model kits, and costly software and equipment, he can't endure much longer. Just look at this dirty paint water. Would you drink this? Would you let your child? Even a small monthly donation can help provide Dean with clean paint water, basic tools for survival, and access to life-saving information and education. So please, follow the links in the description below and find out how you can sponsor a mad cunt like Dean today and end the suffering. Suffering that is cruel, unsustainable, and your fault.